I'd like to open with Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. It says, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure to the order that was given. If even a beast touched the mountains, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you, God of heaven and earth, have received us into your kingdom as part of your redeemed family, young and old and everywhere in between, those who believe in our Lord Jesus have life forevermore. We thank you that you, the holy God, the righteous God, the just God, have accepted us through Jesus Christ, have given us life from the death of sin, and you have welcomed us to live with you forever, to know you, and to glorify you. I pray that today our eyes are open to your words, that our hearts are listening to your voice, that we allow the working of your Holy Spirit within us to illuminate truth to us, that we can cling to it in our hearts, that we can obey it, that we can walk in the truth and the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for each soul here as we assemble in the name of our Lord Jesus, that we can lift high his name, that we can minister to one another, that we can give heed to truth, that we can allow your working to be big in our hearts this morning. We thank you. We give you all praise, honor, and glory, for you are God over all, and you are to be glorified. And we give you glory and praise in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Today, we are continuing in Romans. We're doing the second part of Romans chapter 5, where we're dead in Adam and alive in Christ. Last week, we did the first part of Romans chapter 5, all the results and blessed fruit of justification. And now we're going to get the big picture of how God did this beautiful work through Jesus our Lord. And for our reading this morning, I'd like to invite up Wayne Mazza, who will be reading our text from Romans chapter 5, verse 12 and onward. Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed, where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, 
as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through the righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. That is the word of God. We're gonna... Well, now comes that wonderful moment where we open the book and we sit under the teaching of God's word and to share with us this morning, please stand and welcome Sean Ware. Good morning. God bless you. Please be seated. If you haven't done so already, would you please be so kind to open your Bibles. Join me in Romans chapter 5. We're in part 8 of our series, Death in Adam, Life in Christ. If you'd also at this time bow your heads, a brief prayer. Father, as always at this time, we need your grace and we ask for your grace. As the book is brought out, Father, cause us to, by your spirit, be able to understand these words, to be able to regard Romans and these eternal truths rightly. I pray as I stand here, a, a feeble man, made out of dust and returning to dust, help my words be useful to you and your purposes this morning, Father. Please, God, by your mercy, enliven these truths within us. Cause the sleepy heart to awake, to be able to see your Son in his glory rightly, and our lives is placed securely in him. Father, we ask this for your kingdom and your glory and your purposes, and not for ourselves and our own sake, but for your Son and for the good that you are doing throughout the entire world by this gospel. Help us see it. Help us participate. Help us to live useful in it for your glory in all ages. Amen. Last week we saw, as we entered into this middle section of Romans, chapters 5 to 8, that there's a change of pronouns that began at the beginning of this. Paul is now saying we and us, as Paul is including himself in these truths. As every true preacher is to be saved first by the words that he preaches, and then it saves those that hear him. So Paul's assuming if you've made it this far into his epistle, you've been won over by the sustained persuasion and the astounding magnitude of this grace that God poured out. Chapter 5 began with the statement of matter-of-factness. Therefore, being justified, the arguments are over. You are. Paul's assuming with him you believe this gospel. And now we're just unfolding the wonders of this grace as we're standing justified together. As we saw at the beginning of this chapter, God's love, God's immense love, has been poured out and into us. And we've begun an everlasting work of rejoicing in him, reflecting that there's no greater change than what God has done in us and for us. Consider again briefly with me what God has done with you, as we saw at the beginning of this chapter last week. All of us having gone from a people, as we saw in the beginning of chapter 1, a people who wanted to drag God off of his throne and bring him down here before us as a little idol, demoted and domesticated, dishonored, deprived of his holy demands and denied of his right of righteous wrath. We want a more reasonable and a more manageable God made out of the image and the imagination of that which humans truly desire to worship themselves. It makes for both a cruel, a cruel perversion of God, but also a cruel inversion of us as humans. We who were made by God in the image of God, 
to worship God and only God alone. And yet, daily, this God of love is bringing souls out of that pitch black darkness of depravity to genuine repentance by the power of this gospel. Bringing sinners like me and like you from being those who once shook their fists at the sky and we refuse to bend the knee to now those who won't even lift up their eyes as we bow to the true God of heaven and we desire only to live for his glory and, if needed, willing to die for him. Because, as we saw, his love was poured out on Calvary, but it also continues to be poured out into our hearts each day by the activating of his Holy Spirit, this life of Christ, which now lives within us, causing us to desire only him, to only love him, and find my greatest joy no longer in anything of this world, but in him and him alone. Causing us to comprehend and finally enjoy what it means to truly be human. As our Savior demonstrated in the pattern that he walked before us. After all, what is the whole point of human existence? But to glorify God by enjoying him forever. And so now as we live in this in-between time of the already, but not yet. But we're there, but we're not there. We've entered, but we're still waiting to enter. We enjoy Peace, grace, joy, all the things that all those idols could never actually give us, even in the midst of real suffering, real trials, real hurts, real griefs. It works in us as we keep our eyes on Him, a proven endurance, a proven character, because we understand, we understand. He showed it to us before. Suffering is the only path to true glory. We are following in proven footsteps. Glorying. Rejoicing. Though we suffer. Because we even now get to enjoy some of this heavenly glory. Even now in the hardships of this life, and sometimes it's really hard. Even with flesh, and as weak as it is, in a world that is really dying and passing away, a confidence and assurance of glory, now, even though there's tears, there's trials, there's sorrows, there's death, we hold on to a confident, resting hope. Like David said, in his presence is a fullness of joy, and his right hand pleasures forevermore. It's worth it. It's worth it. By this gospel, we can already taste it, and we see it now. And eternity, <laughs> it's just more of it, but without interruption and without end. So now we get to this rest of chapter 5. And what we're going to see is this chapter gives us God's explanation of what he sees when he looks down at the world. This is God's worldview. This is God's perspective of humanity, which if we're honest, this is the only perspective that matters. Why is this so important? Oh, because this truth blows out of the water. Every other philosophy, everything else that culture might try to say to us to explain why humans are the way they are and why they act the way they do. And so there, that's the problem and here's the solution. This blows them all out of the water. This is truth. This is how it really is. It's not complicated. But it's crucial. Crucial that you see this. You know who's in chapter 5? You're in chapter 5. I'm in chapter 5. Your whole family's in chapter 5. Everybody sitting in your row with you right now, they're in chapter 5. All your colleagues at work, they're in chapter 5. Your parents, your children, your neighbors, everyone you ever see on the street, and everyone you've ever known, and all the people you've never known. They're all in chapter 5. God looks down from heaven, and he looks at earth, and this is what he sees. It's not complicated, but it will blow your mind. Let it. Remember, Romans is getting us to ask about 
all the matters of my life in a new way, in a new gospel lens, and causing me to consider how does the death and resurrection of Jesus change the way I look at this? My work, my marriage, my children, my substance, my next breath. And this chapter reveals how you're supposed to look at everyone. All people, low, high, past, present, rich, poor, wise, foolish, all categorically, all people are placed in only one of two categories before God. And here's what I I really love about Romans. Romans doesn't coddle you. Romans doesn't leave you any room to think that you're right in your own comforts of sin and selfishness and pride, and rebellion in your flesh. It leaves you no quarter. Christianity is not a faith to enhance your own series of thought, or your own ideas, or your own feelings, or your own affections, or your own perspectives, or your own practices. The Bible presents a truth that is greater than you. It's better than you. In magnitude in scope, in wisdom. It's far more glorious because it's from God what the Word reveals to us. Far greater than whatever my own imagination would have ever conjured or desired. Because God Himself is infinite and what I have between my ears is finite. Romans gives us God's picture. Romans expects you to feel and experience as you read these words of great conviction that quite apart from all my own ideas and my own feelings and my own thoughts and my own desires, there is an objective reality, an unchanging truth defined by God that God is and we just have to deal with it. Or not. But he defines reality. We don't. And once we really get a picture of what he wants us to see, we wouldn't want to. It's so much better. It's so much more just. It's so much more loving. It's perfect. God decides what you're like. You don't get to decide what he's like. And so Romans, it smacks us in the face. And it makes us face and confront a worldview that is outside of ourselves. And if you allow it, it will break you, and it will also heal you. If you allow it to bring you low, it will come up under you, and it will lift you up. It will strengthen you, and comfort you, and grant you great peace and lasting assurance, convincing you that God really is God. And he rules over everything. And it's only his truth that will stand in the last day. And what he's done in his son is something that all creation and all history is being reshaped by. And everything you've ever struggled with. And this is why, again, the great, the great desire we have for our church to get Romans Because a lot of people struggle with things that they don't need to. A lot of people are dying out there in darkness, and they don't need to. Everything you've ever struggled with in your entire life is resolved by this eternal truth proclaimed by Romans. The tomb is empty. The throne is occupied. Period. And it's changed you forever. And it cannot be turned back. Everything that's ever harmed you, anything that's ever made you anxious, all the things that have made you to fear, all the times that you've been hurt, or whatever has ever made you to fall, is resolved by this. Jesus died, and Jesus rose again. Period. And it's changed you. And it's healed you. Forever. If you resist this, it will still be true. But don't. Take your heart, push it into this chapter. Get God's worldview, and don't fight it. Wimpy worldviews make wimpy Christians. 
But Romans provides the worldview for Christians who stand through it all. Stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And so here it is. The proper worldview is that out of all humans who have ever and will ever live, they only fall into one of two categories. You're either dead in Adam or you live in Christ. And there's no fence riding. There's no other third option for the objecting or the undecided. But what's more, this section so beautifully reveals that this was always God's plan to leave men after the fall in the condemnation of Adam, so that by one reconciling perfect work, he could one day place us securely in the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ, and we could not mess it up. That's the plan. So yes, Paul is saying us. Paul is saying we. He's speaking to a new community, to his new family, all the redeemed of humanity who he now gets the joy of calling brothers and sisters. We read it today. He never even met us. He will in eternity. Us, we. Do you know why? Because it means everything to him on a personal level. We're no longer in the those or the them category. Two communities, two humanities, the in Adam, the in Christ. Okay, Romans 5, verse 12. It says, therefore, considering, considering what? How we just saw in the chapter before, how that by one man's obedience, it brought such blessings to so many, granting reconciliation to God, causing us to begin this campaign of endless rejoicing and joying in God. Therefore, in that same way, Paul now reveals why we needed all of this so badly again. Because just like that, one man's disobedience brought destruction on so many. See it again. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. This is a rich verse. We'll appreciate it that it gives us three things. Verse 12 first shows us that sin entered into the world through one man, Adam. By Adam, evil invaded the world of human beings. It entered planet Earth in his rebellion. One man, one act of disobedience. Sin enters. Secondly, death entered through sin. So the sin of Adam was the door through which death entered. Just as God promised, dying thou shalt die, both physically, spiritually, eternally. Death entered in, and men died. Thirdly, in this death that came to all men, all men sinned. So, just as death came to Adam because of his sin, and it passes to all of us, death also then came to all of us. Why? Because in him, with him, and like him, we all did what he did. We all have sinned. Now, this is where the flesh pushback starts. Remember? No one likes being told it's their fault. No one wants to hear the bad news. Because, especially in our time, the rise of the concepts of the modern self, how much we worship and are told to encourage all of our interiority, we really don't like this doctrine. How come some naked guy in some ancient garden eating some piece of fruit makes me broken? That's his fault. Make him deal with it. Death and sin for him. Sure, that makes sense. That ain't got nothing to do with me. Remember what Romans gives us? Whose worldview is this? Oh, this is God's. Why is it so important? Because if you understand Adam and Christ, you basically understand all of human history. Why do humans keep doing the horrible things that humans keep doing? Adam. There's only two. There's only two categories. From God's perspective, there's only two men who've ever stood before him. Adam, Christ. And every single person who's ever lived after them 
is found only in one of two men, Adam or in Christ. They are the two representatives of all of humanity. One of two lines, that's it. So whatever Adam did affected you. It affected me. It has affected anyone who has ever lived. But now Jesus Christ is the last Adam, the true and better Adam. And he is now the head of a whole new race of people, those who believe and become credited, clothed with, not their own, but his righteousness. Why? Because now he's their head. Now he's their representative. So everyone who's ever entered into this world starts in Adam, born dead in Adam. Why? Because from God's perspective, when Adam sinned, however thousands of years ago that may have been, we all sinned. We were already charged with Adam's sin and his condemnation before we were born dead in Adam. However, Christ entered the world where Adam disobeyed, Christ obeyed. And now by grace, through faith, Christ's obedience on our behalf credits us, not with my own, but with his perfect righteousness. Born again, alive, not in Adam, in Christ. Does this make sense? It's simple. It's everything. It's astounding. Now, again, you might read this and say, well, I mean, there's so many more categories of people. No, there's not. Well, what about, nope, God's perspective. The only one that matters in heaven and in eternity. This isn't fair. Why am I guilty of a crime that another guy committed? I never met Adam. I wouldn't know him from Adam. (laughs) I didn't eat the fruit. Why am I being blamed and implicated for a crime that I did not commit? Because God is wise. Because God knew this would be the only way he could save imperfect people who are just like Adam. People like me. People like you. And also because this is how birth works. Uh, How many of you got to choose uh, when you were born? How many of you got to choose where you were born? How many of you got to choose your parents? Phoebe, did you get to choose your eye color? No. Lydia, did you get to choose your hair color? No. How many of you got to choose if you were born male or female? You don't get to dictate birth. See, we we cry about these things being so unfair, and it's only from a pride of our own flesh that estimates ourselves to be so much better than we actually are, and so much more deserving than what we've actually earned. Pride always wants credit for what only comes to us because God is gracious. So yeah, it's true. You you didn't get to choose to be born into Adam and in his sin, but do you know what you have gotten to choose every single day since the moment you were born? You chose to sin. Yeah, me too. It's true. We didn't choose to begin sin, but we quickly jumped in with both feet. This is really important because when I remember being younger, I used to read this section and I would get really angry with Adam. Different Adam, not you, brother. But I would get so angry at our great, 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 great grandfather. So angry at him. Anytime I, I, I felt any kind of inconvenience or pain in this life, I'd go, oh, thanks, Adam. If I ever see that guy in eternity. Until I understood Romans rightly, which reveals, sure, yeah, I, I wasn't in the garden, and I didn't eat the forbidden fruit, but if I was, I would have done exactly the same thing. And so would you. How do I know? Because every single day of my life, I prove that I choose the same disobedience. Does that make sense? We just got to lean into this. Don't lean out of it. Let it break you and then it heals you. Let it bring you low and it lifts you up. Okay? Why is this? Because before Christ, I was in Adam and Adam was in me. 
It was my whole identity. It was my whole and only nature. There's a great section of scripture, jot it down. This is Hosea 6, where God is speaking to a disobedient Israel. And he says, therefore, I've hewn them by the prophets. I've slain them by the words of my mouth. And my, my judgment goes forth as the light because I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But just like Adam, they all transgress my covenant and they deal faithlessly with me. Why would thousands of years after Adam, in Hosea's time, in Paul's time, and in our time today, people transgress against God just like Adam? Because Adam is in us. We are born in him, into his rebellion, into his sin, into his death. So just like him, we prove it every day. We're just like our father, Adam, in rebellion, in sin. But before we would ever think again to complain about this being so unfair, here's what's truly unfair. Our question should not be, why does Adam's disobedience make me a sinner? But why does Jesus get punished for my sin? He who knew no sin, God made him to be sin for us. And he bore not his, he had no sin. He bore our sins in his own body upon the tree. The just for the unjust. The spotless Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world. Oh, not his problem. Not fair but the love that drew salvation's plan, the obedience of the Son, and the graciousness extended unto every one of us. You want to talk about unfair? No, let's rejoice and glory in the wonders of this grace. Lean into this. This is the right perspective of humanity. Why should I gain from His reward? That's what's truly unfair. This is the glories of grace by grace, through faith, God has brought us across the uncrossable. Death in Adam to life in Christ. And whatever we lost in Adam, we have gained in Christ so much more. Now, there might be a colon or a long dash in your text at the end of verse 12. Because Paul gets so excited about this that he breaks off his train of thought and he won't resume it again until verse 18. You might even have a parenthesis around 13 to 17 there. So we'll remember that when we come back to verse 18, that therefore, as by the offense of one, we got to pick that up with what he left us with at the end of verse 12. But let's now read verse 13. It says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them who had not sinned after the similitude, it's an old Victorian English word for likeness of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So, again, sin entered, death reigned over everyone from Adam onward. I think we've thoroughly seen this, yes? Even though it's telling us for those who before Moses didn't sin like Adam. They didn't sin like Adam, but they all still died just like Adam. But then Moses came and he brought the law and given to people now is the opportunity to disobey just like Adam with direct and clear commands from God and they still disobey just like Adam did and they still die just like Adam did. Simple. Remember, before the law, without the law, just like we saw in chapter 2, Gentiles still sin against God by breaking the natural laws of their own consciences. But then with Moses and the law, we each got the great privilege of individually, uh, on my own account, get to prove that, yeah, I am just like Adam sinning, proving how desperately we needed a savior. The law makes us all without excuse. Now, we see a really important point here at the end of verse 14. We read that Adam was a figure of him who was to come. What does this mean? figure. It's showing that Adam, in the way he acted as the head on behalf of all humanity, he became a figure, a type, a pattern, a model of the one who was to come, Jesus Christ. And so this is such a great section. Paul wants us to see that they are alike, but yet at the same time he wants us to see, but they're not alike at all. And this, 
<laughs> this is one of those sections of Scripture. You know how Peter says in 2 Peter, you know, some of the things that Paul writes, they're a little hard to understand. But don't twist it. Don't wrestle with it. It's Scripture. You do so to your own destruction. What I love about Paul is he keeps getting so excited about how glorious Christ is and how great the work of redemption is that he accomplished for all. He keeps in desiring to glory in Christ, interrupting himself, and then he does it again, and then he does it again, and then he finally gets back to his point in verse 18. When I read Paul, I, I, I learn much about how to glory much in Christ. Paul will talk about his travel plans, and he'll still somehow juke it to talking about how great Jesus Christ is and all that he accomplished. And so in this section, he's, he's showing Adam was a type. Adam was a, a foreshadowing. But not for a second does he want you to think, oh, Adam and Christ, uh, they're like equal. No! <laughs> he can't let us to think that. So he interrupts himself. And he's showing a foreshadowing. It only gives an outline of something to come. A, a foreshadowing so it's like what's coming, but at the same time, it's very unlike it. Why? Because it's just a shadow. So after he just said they're alike, at the end of verse 14, he now says, but you know what? They're actually not alike at all. Verses 15 to 17. Why? Because Jesus is so much better than Adam. So much more than Adam. Paul can't help himself. He has to interrupt that thought. He wants us to join him in his thinking. Because if we do, then we'll join him in his glorifying Christ like Adam, and yet so vastly unlike Adam because he is so much more superior. Does that make sense? So we see they are alike. How? In principle of representation, right? Two representatives, two heads of humanity, but also they're not alike at all because Jesus accomplished so much more than Adam ever lost. And Jesus has provided far more grace than all the guilt we had in Adam. Read verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, Adam, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. And not as it was by one, Adam, that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one, Adam, to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense, Adam, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. Say his name with me. Jesus Christ. You see it? Oh, they're similar, but they're actually not similar at all. They're alike. Yeah, they both represent humanity, but Jesus is so much better. Don't you dare think they stand on equal ground. And we see these three different ways that what Jesus is and what he has done has vastly surpassed all that Adam did in his rebellion. First, we have death is surpassed by grace. Why? Because the gracious gift of life is so unlike the death that made so many dead. That as great as the death of Adam was, it came to us all by just one moment. One offense. He ate the fruit. He went headlong down into spiritual death. And he pulled the whole train of humanity, like a whole bunch of boxcars, down and off the track and off the cliff with him as he went off, okay? But as great as that death, and it was great, yeah? As many people as that has affected, and it has affected many, yeah? So much more the grace of God. And the graciousness of this gift of life that is abounding over it unto many. Uh, much more powerful is this grace as it penetrates a corrupted world. And it's rescuing people daily, changing them, cleansing them, transforming them, and justifying them forever. So much better. Don't think it's equal. Death. Grace. Secondly, condemnation is surpassed by justification. Why? Because the justification is so not like the condemnation in that the justification is so much more. Although by one act of one man and his sin, judgment came not just to that one man, but to the entire human race after him. Yet by one act of obedience, by one just man, justification was brought to cover entire lifetimes of sin forever countless people countless sin one man 
one work of justification. So much better. Meaning one day when we all stand before an infinitely holy God, despite how much we've all sinned, He stands with us and we will be standing in Him. Credited. Righteous. Not my own, but His perfect justification clothing me. I earned none of this, but by grace, it's all mine. Meaning, just as you were united to Adam and you died in his condemnation because of all this sin, you're now united with Christ forever. And you live forever justified by his perfect obedience. So much more. Thirdly, is everybody still with me? I know it's dense. It's, it's good. It's good. Thirdly, we have Adam so surpassed by Christ. Though they are alike in representation, they are not alike in their accomplishments. Adam brought a reign of death and Jesus brought a reign of life. Adam sins, the whole human race dies in him, dies with him. Why? Our connection with him. We're united to him. Representative, head. How? Because God planned this in his wisdom so that all humanity would be one. What happens to our head? It happens to all of us. But now we look to the one that Adam always foreshadowed, Christ. And now, though my obedience is so not like Christ's obedience, just like the trespass before the law was not like his trespass. Why, what, what's my obedience like? Uh, pretty weak. Yeah, yeah, pretty crummy. I have some good days. I have like good 30-second spurts sometimes. Uh, but what's his obedience like? Perfect. Forever. See? Uh, because he obeyed. Where Adam, where you, where I fall short every single day of our life. He never did. And he never will. And because of that, by grace, through faith, we are rewarded with the gift of his righteousness and his life that never ends. Unfair. Grace. Why? Because we're connected to him. We cannot be separated from him. He is our head, and he represents us before God without end. So then as much as death reigned ruthlessly over the whole human race, it brought sin and sadness and sickness and suffering, physical death, spiritual death, eternal death, much more than that, those who receive the abundance of grace and this gift of righteousness will reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. This is the best news in the whole world, yeah? Christ lines up in opposing and superior ways to Adam in every single way. Regard, And now we come to verse 18 as we round third. For Paul's final conclusion for this chapter showing justification by faith alone. Remember, we want to pick this back up from verse 12, right? Paul's done interrupting himself. He's going to conclude standing in justification now. Read verse 12 again. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Again, Adam's one sin was charged. Why does Paul keep repeating himself? Because you got to get this concept. One man's sin was charged immediately to the account of every single person who would ever be conceived in their mother's womb. New life in that moment, dead already in sin. As God sees it, this is the entire world. You're in Adam or you're in Christ, and there's no third option, no third, no fourth category, no other qualifiers that really matter. Those who are in Christ are those who have been taken out of the first category and they cannot be put back into it. Because what has won them is so much more. It is so vastly superior to what initially harmed them. God's grace is greater than the death. The justification is greater than the condemnation. And Jesus is glorious. So much better than Adam in every single regard. And he's yours and you are his. It cannot be overturned. It cannot be revoked. The tomb is still empty. The throne is still occupied. You cannot be unjustified because Jesus cannot be uncrucified. Verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, 
So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered. Remember the law again, that the offense might abound. Uh, Remember, this whole section began regarding justification in Romans 3.21, when he said the righteousness of God has now come apart from the law. What was the purpose of the law? To show us sin and that it could not save us. We're going to really need a Savior. We're not going to be able to do this ourselves. Right here, so that the law came, so that the offense would abound. The law entered to give this awareness of sin for all mankind. You want to try to do it on your own? Here you go. This is what you have to do. I can't do that. Yeah, that's the point. You want Jesus now? Yeah, I really do. Okay? That's the point of the law. It's good. It's holy. We're supposed to read the law and weep like King Josiah did. King Josiah, they didn't have the word for so long. He read the law. He wept because he realized how far they had fallen from the righteous standards that God expected them as a people to hold. That's what the law is supposed to do. You read it, you weep, you repent, and you say, I'll take Jesus' righteousness, and I'll stop striving on my own. I'll take grace, not works. But as much as sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness (laughs) unto eternal life, by Jesus Christ, our Lord. Last verse, this word reign, it means to exercise an authority like a king over a kingdom. Verse 21 tells us that in this sense regarding justification, there's two kingdoms. There's two kings, and they reign over all people. One of two. Every person's heart today, it, it finds itself under only one of two monarchs. In one, sin reigns. As a king in death, what kind of death? A physical death, a spiritual death, leading to eternal death. Make no mistake, sin is the cruelest tyrant that has ever been or will ever be. And everyone in this kingdom, they have to obey their king. Sin, knowingly or unknowingly, they all bow and they all follow. A sin as a dictator holds this death grip on their heart on their will, and on their minds. You and I, we were born into that kingdom when we came into this world. Sin reigned over our life. We had the stench and the sentence of death on us, and we could not get away from it. But praise God for the kingly reign of his grace. Even so, my grace reign through righteousness. Grace is also like a king, but grace is loving. It is kind. It is gentle. It has our best interests always in heart. Grace reigns over a kingdom of holiness, righteousness, love, and it's leading us always and carrying us into an everlasting kingdom that is all the antithesis of sin and death, eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. As we wrap up here, a concluding thought for application. We've seen pretty clearly there's only two categories for all humans. And in the section that follows here in Romans, as we get into chapter 6, we're going to get into the practicals about our walk in this righteousness, our walk in this grace, our victory daily over sin. But we cannot confuse the Christian walk with the Christian standing. So this is a really appropriate space For our family camp break, give your heart time with this section. Don't read chapter 6 until you master chapter 5. Allow this chapter to finally settle the pushback and let you rest secure with the assurance of grace. There isn't in Adam, in Christ, and then some other third category for however righteous or unrighteous my heart might feel today. It's by grace. It's by faith. You didn't qualify yourself. You cannot disqualify yourself. You were, past tense, in Adam. But now, by grace, through faith, you are in Christ. I don't always feel very righteous. How about you? I have moments where I'm aware of my failing, my warts, my sin, my shame. You know a great question to ask yourself in that moment? Is Jesus still righteous? 
Jonah, is Jesus still righteous? Right. It wasn't my righteousness that I was credited with. It's his. It's his. By grace, through faith, Jesus Christ can never lose his righteous standing before God. If you are in him, why would you be concerned that you could? How many of my sins were still in the future when Jesus died on the cross? What about that that one I just did? Yeah. What about the one I'm going to do tomorrow? The many I'm going to do tomorrow. All of them. All of them. This provides a resting assurance in grace. Once you've been placed in Christ, you cannot be taken out of him. No one can pluck you from the Father's hand. We have friends. Some of you are parents. You have children. They've walked away. They perhaps have even denied the Lord who bought them. But if it's by grace through faith that they were placed in Christ, they cannot go back to Adam. Rest assured in this grace. And lastly, every one of us in this room, we've lost loved ones. There is not a person here who has not felt that grief and pain. It is the worst thing that can happen. And yet even in that, the grave cannot separate us from being in him. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, they sleep. They don't sleep in Adam. They sleep in Christ. Rest in the assurance of that grace. As much as Adam's rebellion changed us and our relationship with God, much more, so much more, Christ's sacrifice changed us and our relationship before God. And now you can never go lower than being righteous and being in Christ. Standing is not based on my obedience, but his obedience. And our Lord reigns sinless. You've gone from in Adam to in Christ. That is a one-way promotion. Rest in the assurance of this grace. It is eternal. It is perfect. It cannot be turned back. And we can sing together with John Newton. Tis grace that has brought me safe thus far. And grace will lead me home. Amen? Amen. God, help our hearts be assured that your grace is good, that your grace is superior, that your grace is enough. And all our sins and all the fallings and all the hurts and all the brokenness in this world, how much better Jesus Christ is. Help our, fa- help our hearts, Father, to be assured that that cannot be turned back, that the devil and all his raging in this world and all its darkness cannot undo what Jesus Christ did, that the stone is rolled away, that our Lord reigns in heaven above, And with assurance that we are his and he is ours and one day soon he comes as our head to gather all those who now live in him. Thank you for this, Father. Amen. Love you all. God bless.